Good afternoon and welcome to the School of Agriculture and Food Science Research Seminar Series. My name is Lorraine Brennan and I'm going to chair today's session. So we've been running this research seminar series for the last five years and it really covers a broad range of research that's pertinent to our school. This is the first time we've gone online, so I really hope it works out today, but please do bear with us in case that we do have technical issues. So we have a series of five lectures that's going to run between now and December, and I encourage you to go to the school's website to have a look at the broad range of topics that we're covering. And they go from right through from animal production, animal science, right through to human health. As with everything, there is a large group of people or a large team behind producing such a seminar series. So I'm just going to briefly thank those individuals involved. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Edel Kelly, who has put in a huge amount of effort to get this series up and running this term. She's done a fantastic job on a range of different um, topics that are, we're going to bring you. And in the background, Juliana Rocca and Valerie Abbott have been working to, with all the technical issues and promoting this seminar series. So a sincere thanks to them all. So today, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Alex Evans. So Professor Evans is the Dean of Agriculture, the Head of the School of Agriculture and Food Science and a Professor of Animal Physiology in UCD. He's attracted considerable funding for his research and has supervised over 39 graduate students, published over 145 reviewed papers and served as a co-editor for the international journal Animal Reproduction Science. And importantly, he is the Vice President of the Association of European Life Science Universities. Today, he's going to give a presentation that's not linked to his research, but actually it's based on his experiences of being Dean and Head of School. So I'm delighted to welcome Alex to give us his views on the challenges facing agriculture and life science universities. So over to you, Alex. Fantastic, Lorraine, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me okay. Good to go. Great. I am going to uh, share the screen with you. Uh, and, uh, hope it's going to work. Okay, so um, just while that comes up, thank you very much for the introduction. And um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's great to be here today. Thank you very much for inviting me. And also thanks to those who've organized this series of lectures. Um, <clears throat> I've always enjoyed them in person in past, and I look forward to the, the presentations in the, in the coming weeks and months. Um, sorry, you can't be with us in UCD today, um, but maybe we can actually have a, a broader reach um, than we might, might usually have. So, as I understand it, most of the viewers today are, are from UCD, but I think there are also a few people who are from outside the university. So just before I launch into the discussion, I want to give you a little bit of background because I've given versions of this talk before, and I think the context is always very important. Um, you know, clearly um, I'm in UCD. UCD has got a, 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 a long history. Um, the university was founded in 1854. But our heritage in agriculture and food science goes back to the Albert College from 1838, which makes it, uh, if not the oldest, one of the oldest colleges uh, specifically dedicated to agriculture, um, certainly in these islands, if not in Europe. Uh, we're the largest university in Ireland. Uh, you can read the numbers there. We're about a third of our students are graduate students, a third of our students are international. Um, the proportion of our funding that comes directly from the government is decreasing all the time, and this creates challenges. And we have a poor staff-student ratio by uh, international standards, and these create other challenges as well. So um, the kind of topics I'm going to touch on are, as you might imagine, education and research. Uh, some of the challenges that I see for running a university or a large faculty uh, towards the end, I'm just going to touch on some of the, the global challenges of which you've heard many of, be, many of them before. And then I'll, I'll end with a couple of slides of conclusions and maybe ask you some questions. This is very much a kind of personal view of things. Uh, I'm going to touch on a number of topics, most of which I'm sure you have heard. 
and um, some of which I'll give some detail and others which I'll skirt, skirt over and delighted to, um, to talk more about them later on if, if that's what your interest is. Now, if you look at the whole area that we occupy, uh, the uh, agriculture and the life sciences topics, and you try and think about what we're actually doing here and what sort of knowledge you need to be good in this area, um, we very quickly conclude that you have to have a very broad knowledge of the natural sciences, the social sciences, and the applied sciences. If we look at some of our colleagues in competitor colleges, faculties, even universities, they might only focus on one of these. They might just be a natural basic science, or they might be just a social science, or they might be a, a more applied science. And I think this is, um, can be viewed two ways, both as a strength and as a weakness. Uh, it's a strength in that we have a very broad reach, but it's a weakness in that we're constantly struggling to try and balance off the things that are against each other. So going on from that, if you look at our education challenge, it's this sort of multidisciplinary issue where um, all our topics are becoming increasingly complex and there's more and more to learn. And how do you organize a curriculum around that? Um, or do you embrace the, the challenge of specialization where you acknowledge that people are not going to be good at everything? Um, and then you give them a sort of a general knowledge where they have a little bit of information about a lot of things, or do they have a lot of information about very few things? And again, depending on degree programs or education streams, uh, you can build them according to these, uh, these sort of limitations. And it, it does actually create opportunities for new degree options if you um, put some of these things together in, um, in different uh, arrangements. Um, the challenging facing learning really is that there is a reduced emphasis on information acquisition Certainly since many of us were students in universities, uh, information is now something which is essentially freely available. And there's really a switch to increasing emphasis on understanding, uh, comprehension, um, uh, decision making, and analysis of, of that information which is freely available. So that's, I think that's the big change basics of, of learning that we are experiencing uh, in our time at the moment. So what are the key components um, of a good program? Well, obviously, you have to have a deep knowledge of your subject matter. If you're a food scientist or a soil scientist, you actually have to know food science and soil science. And uh, we shouldn't get away from that. And I don't want to undermine the deep knowledge required in your area of specialization. But there's huge emphasis placed on all these kind of transversal skills now analyzing and evaluating data, critical thinking, problem solving. Ethics is something which doesn't appear in many programs, um, which maybe we sort of infer occasionally, but maybe we should give a little bit more attention to. Um, organization and collaboration is really important. Tolerance and respect, adaptability and resilience. Goodness me, look at the adaptability and resilience that people need to have now to um, deal with their education or even yeah, provide the education if you're looking at it from my side of the desk. Um, what sort of environment do we have to eat for thinking? <clears throat> well, traditionally we had the classroom um, as a place where, where it all happened. Um, we also have practical and applied learning experiences in the field or in work um, and um, these some of, of these off-campus opportunities really um, are important for our interactions with our practitioners, as many call them, the people who are actually engaged in, in their subject, many of whom are our alumni, which provides a great link between us and them into the wider world. You've got outside the classroom, um, and that's what I look as um, the not for credit learning that students achieve whilst they attend a university. Um, how well do we promote this learning outside the classroom? And um, can we do better in ensuring that our students get greater value from this learning outside the classroom? 
And I think over the last few months, I've actually come to uh, think that this is actually a distinctive feature of university life. And that um, I've said it before that I think only half of what students learn, they learn in the classroom and the other half is with their friends and colleagues and their strangers and their clubs and societies and all the challenges that they have to overcome to, um, to, to get through their university. Online learning, I couldn't not have a bullet on that. Uh, it's basically being redefined by our public health challenges. And this is constantly evolving. Whilst it sounds simple, it's constantly evolving. And there are many strengths, but there are also many weaknesses um, associated with the online learning. I'll say a few more words in, in a moment. Globalization is part of our um, education environment. Uh, study abroad is becoming commonplace in universities now, certainly giving students opportunities to do that. And, um, you know, students participate at different levels in, in, in different, um, in different programs and different organizations. But um, under normal circumstances, we provide a lot of opportunities for this. And um, I think it's really part of making our, our global citizens um, increase student mobility uh, and the increased need for cooperation amongst universities is probably where we're going further into the future. Uh, for effective study abroad and even work experience opportunities. So if you're looking at your university or your faculty or your department, you're trying to decide, well, who do we actually teach? Well, traditionally we teach our university students, the ones who uh, enroll for a number of years, um, start in the beginning and graduate at the end, but really, we are moving to a much broader community of learners now. And you could say that only attending university for four or five years between the ages of 18 and 24 actually could be a lost opportunity in terms of education and that we should be thinking on a much longer time horizon about lifelong learning, continuous professional development and executive education. And uh, it's a little bit difficult because if you were to string these all together, one after the other, you might have a, a special, a particular kind of program. But those engaged in CPD and executive education are often people who graduated five to maybe 20 years ago, and their learning requirements after they graduated are quite different to recent graduates. So there's quite a bit of thought required to get this um, offering correct and to get it really valued. The last group that we should really focus on, on teaching are our own staff. You know, we're all, we're all on a journey of learning and, um, you know, uh, providing opportunities for our own staff to, to learn and advance their own careers is, is critically important. Okay, so, um, what about the disciplines of the future? Somebody might say, will we be always doing as we've done in, in the past? So, you know, the traditional subjects I think will remain strong, you know, animals, plants, soil, food, nutrition, um, breeding and genetics and so on and so forth. The traditional topics that have been around for many, many years. But, you know, there are a few disciplines which are um, Certainly coming to the fore and uh, the challenge of molding old programs into new or generating new programs is something we're, we're all faced with. Animal and plant health, um, you know, you, 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 you can't um, have a conversation without bringing those topics in. Food security and integrity and food systems, business and trade maybe is an old topic, but something which is probably uh, increasingly important environment and climate sustainability. UCD have a new degree program now called sustainability. Uh, energy, uh, energy production and energy consumption affects many, many assets of aspects of life, including our agriculture and food and life science programs. Healthy systems, uh, waste reduction and management, social and behavioral sciences. So how do we bring these into our fora for our education programs. 
either explicitly or a little bit more covertly to make sure students are, are up to speed. If you look at these topics in their entirety, you're really looking at the One Health approach to, um, to, uh, to our topics. And um, certainly that, that's, that's an umbrella under which education can be, can be organized. So um, the last couple of days I asked myself, what have we actually learned from our current pandemic for the delivery of education? Um, we're delivering a lot of our education at distance now. Um, certainly uh, for the next few weeks, we will be doing that in UCD almost exclusively at distance. It is very difficult. It has actually been done very well by um, many of my colleagues. Um, and it does have its benefits, but it does have its challenges. So um, whilst it is difficult, it is also quite successful. In, uh, in many regards. Nonetheless, there is a whole bunch of obstacles to make this distance learning um, effective and successful. Um, from a pedagogical point of view, how is the best way to learn different elements? And some elements simply cannot be learnt online. And um, we need to recognise what those are and then devise alternative systems. Um, what sort of software packages or programs, what hardware challenges, what internet access challenges are there? Um, and they all have to be overcome um, by the whole organization and by individuals delivering and receiving their education. They have to engage with all these things. And if you think about the, um, the distribution of even internet access or, or access to computers in some homes, um, this challenge um, sort of asks us how fair or how equitable is it for us to expect all people to learn um, using uh, online systems that we devise. If you have no internet access or if you're sharing a computer with your mother, father, brother, sister, son or daughter, how do you actually organize your day? And uh, it's quite possible that uh, moving online actually makes um, a university education um, more challenging for some and possibly more elitist in some situations. We've got to be aware of this, we've got to try and tackle it. What's the student experience of learning online and are we able to prepare them for whatever you're trying to prepare them for? And maybe that comes back to the pedagogical level challenge, although the notion that not all you learn is in the classroom uh, comes to my mind there. Um, so I, I do think that um, distance education is here to stay. However, I think that face-to-face uh, -face interactions will um, be recognized uh, as important, but probably in the future, those face-to-face -face interactions will be for more, let's call it high value learning opportunities involving the problem solvings and the discussions and the critical thinking, etc. So that maybe the more um, anonymous uh, provision of information will be done more online, but there'll be much richer discussions um, and, uh, and, and other opportunities for those face-to-face uh, -face activities when they become more, um, when they become more available, uh, hopefully in the coming weeks and months. Now, there's a tremendous amount of good news for those of us involved in the education business. Um, I'm sure you've all heard there's a war for talent and that, uh, you know, leadership and talent are the biggest opportunity and the biggest constraints on progress. If you talk to many companies, um, the success of those companies um, often depends on the quality of the people that they hire. And if they get great people, they can make great progress, but if they're not able to get them, it's actually a constraint for progress. So, so this is never before was there a more vital role for us to play in, in developing and nurturing talent for society. And um, I often say that to my colleagues, um, we're in a business that's in high demand and we have to figure out how best to deliver it and produce those 
really talented leaders for the future. I move on uh, education and uh, talk a little bit about research now. Um, where do you start and where do you stop on research in the whole agriculture and life sciences area? And uh, I'm keeping it more so high level. Um, if you're trying to do good research, you have to hire the best people to do the best research. Um, you have to have the best facilities and you have to have the equipment. And those facilities and equipment are becoming bigger, they're becoming more complicated, they're becoming more expensive, and collaboration is becoming more and more um, of, a, of a solution to overcome some of these problems. But this is the, this is the, the general direction we're moving into. I guess funding models for research are constantly evolving. Um, more collaboration is needed, for sure. Um, more industry involvement is now encouraged and will become more of a requirement into the future. And it's becoming more complex. These funding models are becoming more complex. But again, those are the those kind of things we're in. There's also a competing demand for the needs of basic and curiosity driven research versus research having to have a greater impact, um, which I sort of summarize as payback to stakeholders. And if you look at the facilities challenges and if you look at the funding challenges, um, you can appreciate how um, these demands of basic and curiosity versus impact research have different values to different funders. And obviously they have different, um, different time horizons. I just wanted to throw in at the bottom here that I think university farms are really critical. Um, there is an increasing need for large scale research and also for the development and the demonstration of new technologies. Universities have definitely got a role to play in developing new technologies, but then they have to demonstrate those to their community and um, engage with society and engage with their stakeholders. So I really think that uh, university farms will become more important um, as time goes by. Now, now, um, um, these are again some of my own views on uh, if you're going to make progress in research, what do you need? If you're working in a natural sciences area, um, you're working with and trying to understand nature where you are enhancing, maintaining it, or even changing nature. Um, you're looking for new approaches and new efficiencies and progress can often be slow. But um, it's obviously fascinating to many of us who are engaged with this. If you're actually working in applied science, you know, I sort of say like engineering, you are probably trying to solve a very well-defined problem, which is different to the natural science where um, the, the problem mightn't be so obvious. And you're trying to build a novel solution, which again is different uh, to, a, to a natural science. And progress is, is often rapid in this area, and it's usually proportional to the amount of money that is spent. And that's not true in the natural sciences. Um, progress is often slow and um, uh, dependent on many other factors rather than just how many iterations of um, something can be built. And then you've also you know, got a third sort of leg to looking at progress in research um, and that's working with people where clearly issues of behavior and business models are central to um, making progress in the social sciences you might say and here progress is kind of totally unpredictable uh, from from my point of view anyway and um, is uh, it's 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 a different mindset to to the two to the two earlier ones and again i think in our area agriculture and life science research actually requires all of these pieces not only are we dealing with very complex natural situations or trying to build engineering solutions we're also working with the people who are going to use them or implement them or benefit from them and trying to get these pieces to work together is is a research challenge and they have different timelines and we should probably have different expectations for each of them. 
Okay, so uh, just keep moving, moving on here. Um, what about challenges for our university? Well, so, you know, finances is a, is a, is a big challenge. Uh, the funding models are changing. Uh, external income, industry, philanthropy, partnerships, collaborations. Our universities run as charities or businesses with profits and loss. Um, there is a sort of a philosophical approach there, um, but universities can't run at a deficit. They have to. Uh, they they have to be able to pay the bills. Um, universities are always also large with um, a set of uh, uh, infrastructure, some very old and some very new buildings. And this whole timeline of designing them, planning them, building them, maintaining them, repurposing them and making them sustainable is another big challenge for universities. Certainly as um, the needs of buildings changes and the whole sustainability challenge uh, is not going to go away. A third point I've got here is um, the impact that universities have is, is critical. Um, the contribution to global needs is maybe obvious. We're all trying to um, cure a disease or, or solve a hunger problem. But what is our contribution to local or national needs? These, I think, are much less obvious. And they could be more challenging. And they are regional and specific and difficult. And this may be what separates some universities from others, where the regional and the local needs are different for different universities, whereas we might all be working on the same kinds of global needs. And these will impact our, our success and the, the role we have in, in the difference. Our uh, university staff are our greatest resource. Um, we should have the ambition to attract and retain and um, not to view our staff as a static resource. Um, they require constant upskilling and education. They need opportunities for career progression. Uh, we all uh, aspire to, to these kinds of things. Um, requiring recognition and reward is for real. Uh, it's complicated and it's something we can't shy away from. And then the whole equality, diversity and inclusion issue is very much uh, to the forefront. And I think if you simply consider that the society that we live in is increasingly complex, we have to allow our workforce and our community in the university to become in increasingly complex and we must adapt to allow that and to be a good place to work. University needs to have uh, strong reputations. Uh, let's see, reputation accounts for everything. Um, are we reliable and are we trustworthy? Um, think of an example where you may or may not be, or you are perceived as being or not being. Um, do we actually maximize our reputation? And I suppose with readily available news or maybe even fake news, I think universities sh should continue to build their reputation as a source of high quality and reputable information. This is a real opportunity for just a couple of the pictures, you know. How do people decide to uh, have a high meat diet or a flexitarian or a vegan diet? And what information do they use to make that decision? And is that good information? And um, how, how, uh, what, what's our role in, in helping people with making those decisions? And people make decisions for different reasons, but I would like to think they do it with useful information. Um, Here's a picture of, uh, uh, of a burger with no meat in it. This is the impossible meat option. And again, um, what is the knowledge required around making this successful um, or uh, competing with other products on the market? Um, when I first gave this talk, uh, Brexit was a huge issue. And again, there was all sorts of rubbish floating around in the media. What's the role for the university? And now you've got the whole coronavirus challenge and, um, you know, it's great to see learned people getting engaged in the, the science behind this. And hopefully the public are, are learning. Okay, I'm just watching the clock quickly here. So I'm going to skim on uh, quickly to, uh, to this last topic on global challenges, which, you know, you don't need a lecture from me really, but it's, 
best described by the Sustainable Development Goals, of which I'm sure you recall there are 17. I suppose I summarise them as about um, sustainable life on Earth, um, energy, climate change, and biodiversity, um, looking at in in inequality and social justice issues, um, health and well-being of our people and our plants and our animals and our environment. And now we're getting back to the behavior on the political side, redefining Europe, or some would suggest we should even redefine democracy, certainly with some of the uh, events of recent months and years with fake news, with populism, with migration and war. Um, these are all um, global challenges. And I suppose I asked myself, what's the role for agriculture and life science universities? And um, if you drill down into the sustainable development goals, many of them rely on knowledge that we would produce or education that we would provide. Um, just a comment on the sustainable development goals. They were prepared in 2015. And I only really recently realized that progress of the SDGs was dependent on sustained economic growth of the world and globalization of the world. And since the coronavirus pandemic, economic growth and globalization have both stopped, as evidenced by nearly a million people have died. It's 973,000 as of this morning. Economies are in recession. People are borrowing money. Countries are borrowing money. Aid around the world will drop by billions of dollars to people who need aid, to whom um, um, many of the sustainable development goal issues were, were absolutely critical. The United States has withdrawn from the World Health Organization, and you saw a lot of posturing going on in the United Nations meeting yesterday. Food security is under threat. We've got climate change with storms and wildfires and droughts and floods. Um, these things are all threatening the um, potential of the sustainable development goals to the point that some have suggested that 65% of the SDGs are not going to be met by 2030. So um, what are we going to do about this? Um, are the sustainable development goals fit for a pandemic age when globalization and economic growth has stalled? And um, I think there are a couple of suggestions going around, but I actually like this one, that maybe they should be simplified to possibly six large topics around human well-being, sustainable economies, access to food and nutrition, access to and decarbonization of energy, urban development, and the global environment, including um, biodiversity, climate change. And, you know, I think just getting back on topic, you know, education in agriculture, in food and nutrition, in the environment were never more important. So again, the work that, uh, that we are doing is is really um, is really critical to uh, keeping uh, keeping providing solutions and hopefully making some progress against the the challenges that are are recognised in the sustainable development goals. Even if we won't be able to meet them at the rate that was originally anticipated in 2015. Now, Lorraine, I'm nearly done. Only two slides left. Um, by way of a conclusion, um, there are many societal challenges that are relevant to agriculture and life science universities. Um, university, uh, you know, sustainability relies on our education and our research, which is kind of like our core business. But I think the importance of our staff and our operating philosophy and our collaboration are things which are coming to the fore now. And the impact that universities have, their wider contribution and their relevance is uh, something that more and more people are engaged in, all the way down to individual grants and individual programs. So last, I've got a couple of uh, wicked challenges that I would like you to think about. Um, is it possible in university to be more international but to travel less? 
We've certainly hardly traveled at all in the last little while, and does this threaten our internationalization? Can we be more collaborative, but be more business-like? Um, can we be more elitist? We all aspire to be the best and to uh, work with the best, but can we be more inclusive? We really have to be inclusive to be successful as a university and work with, um, with all stakeholders and all partners. And um, Suppose, can we expand our universities, but can we consume less? Um, you know, the capitalist model is really uh, relies on expansion uh, to survive, but now we know that consumption uh, presents a challenge in itself. So these two things, um, these two things are, are, are at odds, I would argue. And then I suppose, can we enhance our university experience, but can we do this with social distancing? Um, so, um, to me, these are uh, five interesting questions that should shape our thoughts on our approaches to, uh, to how we, we deliver our product and engage with our, our colleagues and our stakeholders. Lastly, you know, I'm very proud to be working in the agriculture and food sciences area. I think it's the best sector to be in to be relevant to the challenges of today. And I think that um, it allows us to take advantage of opportunities as they arise. And I think we can make a difference. And we do this through the people we teach and we do this through the knowledge that we, that we gain. So Lorraine, thank you very much again for inviting me to uh, talk to you this afternoon. And I don't know if you've got any questions there on the, on the chat, but I'd be, glad to, uh, I'd be glad to give them a go if I can. Thank you very much, Alex. That was um, a, a fascinating talk and you've touched on so many, so many topics that I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. So I should have mentioned at the beginning, and I'm sorry, I forgot to, that you can put in your questions in the Q&A and then I'll um, try and moderate them with, with Alex and we'll hopefully get a nice discussion going. We can stay on for 10 to 15 more minutes just to maybe engage a little bit or discuss some of those topics that Alex has, has um, asked us. So don't be shy. You can ask your, your questions. I might I might get get started, Alex, while people are getting um, their questions ready. So you you touched on such a broad range of, of topics there. It's hard to know where to start with. But one thing that I was fascinated with was kind of the obstacles we have to delivering programs online in our current scenario. And one of the things you highlighted was the challenges that are going to be for students in terms of fairness and EDI. So, so that's a, a, a real problem, I guess, for us. And, and do you have any ideas or concepts of how we, we could, as d delivering our programs, be overcome some of these issues? Oh, overcoming them, I think, first of all, we have to recognize them, Lorraine. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've all heard from students who say, my internet is poor or even non-existent. Well, um, if you deliver a live lecture and expect them to get it, um, during those 50 minutes or not at all, you are putting them at a disadvantage immediately. So you have to think, how can you overcome that? And clearly putting it up in a format that they can access it in their own time is, is an obvious solution. Um, but, you know, if our economy is suffering in a pandemic and people are losing their jobs and, um, you know, they require access to technology, which costs money, then we have to recognize that there are bound to be some households like this and universities need to put something in place and to allow those students to either um, receive uh, hardware from the university or maybe even to come onto campus and use the university's facilities to, to learn at distance. Um, I think certainly from my own point of view, the first challenge is to try and recognize some of the issues and then, um, you know, bang heads with a few people to think about what, what the solutions will be. But not everybody can learn at the same rate or take advantage of the, uh, the opportunities. Uh, not everybody is the same and we have to try and figure that out for them. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And, and there was a question in the chat that was kind of just asking you some of those things, but you've actually an, uh, answered them. Um, yeah. Um, and the other thing that I was um, also just that you pointed out kind of as the wicked challenges, um, one that struck me was how, 
can can we still become international and maintain an international presence but travel less? Um, that that's a very hard one to think about and to think about solutions for. Do you have any any ideas or concepts on that? Jeepers, that's one that I I'm struggling with because I've travelled a lot in my lifetime and I have really enjoyed it and I have learn so much by meeting people from other cultures with other experiences and um, finding a way to do that um, without you know living it and breathing it or standing in somebody else's lab I um, I think that is a big challenge for us um, maybe what we'll do is we will be more targeted in our um, in our journeys and we will have maybe higher value travel if you know what I mean and that when we go somewhere we might not flit in and out for a day or two but we might stay for a week or more and get more value out of it so um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this evolves but I do think travel and our sort of international perspective is going to have to change um, and I don't know how it's going to affect our, our sort of global footprint but yeah yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I think that um, it's something that as academics, we all have to think about and we're going to have to see how we can make our international presence, but um, in, in reducing our necessity or the need or the, the, the to travel to do it. Um, and, and it's going to be challenging. And I, and I think it's go going to be very, very tra challenging. Um, Olaf is asking, um, what's your take on Brexit? Do you um, see is it more as a threat or an opportunity for us? Oh, I think it's only going to be a threat. Yeah. Whilst, you know, I think the education system is not directly in the firing line. We're very much, um, we're very much at the whims of our economy. And I think that Brexit is going to be bad for our economy. Um, can we take advantage of some of the opportunities? Maybe, you know, English speaking, European Union. Um, yeah, remains to be seen. But I, I think it's, there's more downsides than upsides to, to Brexit for, for us all. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, an, it's another, another threat for us. Um, Owen is asking, um, how do we as educators engage students who have limited attention spans and resources? Um, and resources to resource them to be knowledge creators in the current um, COVID-19 environment. Yeah. I think that's, I, that's very difficult. I, I think it is difficult, Owen, thanks for your question. Um, but look, this is part of us trying to figure out what's the best way to educate them. Um, um, I'm just trying to remember, but many years ago, you know, the question was, why is a lecture 50 minutes? And the answer was because that's the attention span of an adult. But in fact, the attention span of an adult is only two or three minutes. So, you know, maybe we should uh, uh, do away with these long lectures and maybe we should be breaking it up into bite-sized pieces that people can, um, die, they can take it in and then they can think about it and then they can put it in context and then they can go on to the next piece whereas you know we're just trying to pass huge volumes of information to them um, and we're frustrated by their attention span to acquire that <clears throat> so maybe we need to just think about different ways of of feeding it to them and i think as i said our face-to-face uh, -face interactions with them be they in person or be they be they online will probably be for those higher value things to um, maybe turn them into the thinkers and the leaders and the doers uh, for the future. Um, but it's it's certainly an evolving space. Yeah, and I, and I guess it is important for us all to to acknowledge that and um, maybe think about in the future when if we when, when and hopefully that we do get back to normal about taking some of the learnings that we have from from COVID nineteen. Mm. Um, David is, is has brought up a very interesting. Um, argument here so he's talking about that COVID has um, seen the emergence of anti an anti-science movement with mm -hmm. regards to vaccination um, and it has um, I guess sometimes been um, enabled by social media to a certain extent um, but we have similar anti-science activity always kind of bubbling on the surface um, with regards to agriculture and probably 
particularly involved in, in food production with um, misinformed things about um, agriculture, biotechnologies, etc. So yeah. he, David's asking a very nice, important question, I guess, should universities engage more formally and actively with social media to try counter this? Yeah, I think the answer is definitely, you know, universities have to work on their reputation, which is a source of high quality um, and digestible knowledge. And I think we can't just say we write it in scientific publications or we print it in books. We have to engage in, um, we have to engage in those things. And, you know, I'm maybe a sort of an optimistic person, but whilst there is a very loud voice against vaccinations and, and, and other things, uh, I'd like to think that there's a lot of sort of sensible people out there who have weighed out the knowledge and, and come to a different conclusion to that. But it's absolutely critical that we engage. Uh, I just had a walk around the building there this, the, the, this morning and uh, there was a cartoon on a door and it says that in 1980, an expert was a, a university professor. And a few years later, it was um, a, a graduate student and now an expert is just somebody who's on Facebook. So I think we have to um, present the knowledge that we have. We have to do it in an, in an unbiased and, and in an honest way. And we have to uh, accept that there are other people who don't agree with us. But we have to allow um, you know, our community access to that knowledge and give them our perspectives. And then hopefully um, you know, they'll, they'll make good decisions. So we are, uh, you know, communications is, is critical and it's only going to get more complicated and possibly more important. Yeah, and I think for, for me at the beginning, we'll say that during lockdown, the communication from the government and the uh, messaging was very simple, very straightforward and, and very impactful. Um, mm. And I, I couldn't help but thinking, God, could we do something like that in, in, in agriculture, food science, nutrition, really strip it back to very simple messages and get it very powerful messages across to, to people and learn from how, how that was done during that lockdown period. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Simple messages on complex topics, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 but you need to reach, maybe, maybe sometimes we bring, we want to explain too much sometimes, I think, as scientists. Mm -hmm. um, so we have another question. Um, I, I think it comes back to the same um, issue of going forward, we will probably have a mix of teaching online and face-to-face, -face, but actually we do need investment from the government to improve network connections. Um, and investment to make sure that there's a quality for all students. And that's just a comment that we got there from Julia. Yeah, I think that's definitely fair enough. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any, any other questions for Alex? Okay. There's a few more just coming up. Um, just somebody said that we, um, again, that we're fortunate enough that there is an increasing level of, level of awareness um, uh, with our e on EDI and awareness of people um, from an EDI issue, which is, which is true. Um, and then Tommy is, ta is asking about aging infrastructure supporting research and teaching. Um, how can we better leverage our alumni to help us support um, upgrading our facilities and funding programs? Is there any thoughts on that, Alex? You know, um, they're possibly a, a community who we haven't interacted with as, with as well as we should have in the past. Certainly, um, we don't do it as well as American universities. Um, I don't think we should complain about that. I think we should do something about it. And I think that we need to demonstrate our relevance to them. And once they um, see the relevance of what we do and um, buy into our, our ambition, um, you know, they are more willing to get involved, whether that's to take our students for work experience or to uh, collaborate with us on a research project or to give us some sort of a donation or contribution to a, a piece of infrastructure. Uh, you know, relationships are complex and our alumni are the same. And it probably boils down to a lot of the things I touched on, which is about being relevant and being understood 
So, um, yeah, it's uh, the opportunity is there. Um, how to make progress on it is probably there's no one answer, but it's something that we need to we need to keep working at. Okay, um, I think that um, in the interest of time, we can we can wrap up. So I would again like to thank Alex. Alex, it was a, a very um, fascinating talk, and you thank you very much for covering such a broad range of topics. I think it gets us all thinking about different aspects um, of teaching and research in the in the university and the challenges that are facing us as we we go forward. Um, just to remind everybody that um, is online, this is this was the first of our um, research seminar series. So we do have um, four more between now and December. So I'd encourage you to go to the website and register for them and to um, attend them. So again, thank you all for attending today and thank you all for contributing in terms of questions and a special thanks to Alex again for delivering the talk. Thanks very much, Lorraine. See you. Bye bye now.